talking about presentation. Dominique, bring up my presentation. I want the ministers uh, to, you know, uh, before I bring on Senator Booker to give greetings, then he's going to speak at the planner. He's not going to do his main sermon in here because y'all know he could preach. But uh, he wanted to come and say hello to the ministers, and then Congresswoman McBath is going to speak in our plenary session on gun violence, starting in a few minutes across. But uh, three months ago, God blessed me with my first grandchild. This is Marcus Al Shopton Bright. <laughs> he actually woke up and said hello to the Senate. I don't know what that means. <laughs> All right. Oh. He'd been here all week, but the ministers was the only place I brought him up. I wanted my fellow yokemen to pray for my grandson. Let us hear some greetings from the senator from New Jersey, candidate for president. He will give his major address across at our plenary session. I'm asking everyone to stay and go over there so you can hear him and Congresswoman McBath. But let us hear Senator Cory Booker. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is good to be here. I want to give greetings to uh, Dr. Richardson, the chairman of NAN. I want to let you all know I got to give greetings to my minister who is in this room, Dr. David Jefferson, who's here. Um, I want to give my gratitude to a lot. I see a lot of New Jersey pastors here that have been very influential in my life and my career. And I want to give greetings, of course, to the Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, Reverend Al is right. I will have a chance to speak about really important issues and policy over there. But I just want to stand here and let you know that this gathering of clergy is critically important not just because of now and where we must go, but we must recognize that we are here, not just as a black community, but because of an American community, because all of the progress we've seen from the labor movement to the suffrage movement to the civil rights movement has come through the black church. My family history is steeped in the black church from family members who were ministers and deacons and choir directors to my mama who taught Sunday school in a small black church in New Jersey. We have come this far by faith. And at this time more than ever, we must recognize that we are in a moral moment. I'll be speaking to policy, but we are in a moral crisis when we have a nation that has children in millions of our kids in jurisdictions, thousands of them in our nation, where they can more easily find unleaded gasoline than unleaded water. We are at a moral crisis in this country when we have a criminal justice system that treats you better, as my friend Brian Stevenson says, when you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. We have a moral crisis in this country when large corporations are able to privatize their profits but push the cost onto communities like I saw in places like Duplin County, North Carolina, where an African-American community is surrounded by industrial agriculture, Smithfield, international companies, in this case a Chinese one, that is literally poisoning their soil and their water with these massive concentrated animal feeding operations. Where I stood in a black church as folks told me that they couldn't open their windows or uh, allow their, run their air conditioning or put their clothing on lines because of what's happening to them. 
This is a moral moment in our country, and that's why I was so happy that I could speak a little bit before I go in there and put my senatorial hat on, but put the hat on of a boy that grew up in a black church and just say to you that this is not a political season. This election is going to come and go. We have a moral movement that we must create. And I still believe that faith without works is dead. I still believe that when we come together, there is power because the Lord has told us whenever two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in the midst. This is a moral moment. And I know that we have power, we are told, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So I want you all to know where I am and what motivates me every single day because I have spent my entire career not looking for the lofty areas to live. I have tried to find the calling of my country. When I grew up in New Jersey, as soon as I got my degrees and my daddy wasn't satisfied, he's like, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> Life ain't about the degrees you get, it's about the service you give. And so I joined my brothers and sisters in the central ward of Newark, New Jersey, where I've lived for decades now. No matter what title I have held, from senator to lawyer, I have lived in my community. A community folks have turned their back on, a community that folks look down upon, and I joined that community in struggle. I'm the only person right now in the United States Senate that lives in a black and brown community that is below the poverty line. Median income where I live is $14,000 per household. But we are a proud community that takes on fights. And I always say I got my BA from Stanford, but my PhD on the streets of Newark. From folk who are fighting and winning battles. Some of them here are in this room. And so I just want to leave with a spiritual message of crisis for me. You know, we have shootings still. Even though my mayor, Ross Baraka, is driving down shootings, we still have too many kids that are killed. I chose to live. I live about 100 yards from there now, but I chose to live for almost a decade in high-rise what became public housing projects. I moved into those buildings in 1998, lived there until 2006. And this community, the buildings were dilapidated, no heat, no hot water, roaches, mice, all kind of challenges, a slumlord that we eventually got to go to federal court for his crimes. But the community was spiritually strong. We stood by each other. And there were some boys that, that, that grew up in that community. I watched them grow up. But one night I was coming home, and, 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 and I smelled something in that lobby of my building that I hadn't smelled that strong since I was at Stanford. It was marijuana. But you all know that black boys in inner cities do not have the same margin for error or, ex or experimentation as privileged people at our universities. There is no difference between blacks and whites for using marijuana, selling marijuana, but if you're black, almost four times more likely to be arrested for it and to get a lifetime sentence. Well, I knew I got to intervene with these boys, so I started talking to them, spending more time in the lobby, but I'll tell you what, I got busy. I was running for mayor. I'm embarrassed to tell you, I got busy. I, I did some things with them. I asked them, let's go to the movies. I, I shouldn't have let them pick the movie because they picked a movie called, oh, it was terrible, <laughs> called Saw. Uh, uh, some of you all might know. It took about two days, but I got too busy because I was running for office. I still, I still spent some time with the kids, but I couldn't follow up on all the mentorship that I wanted to do with them because I was running for mayor. I thought in the back of my mind, hey, if I become the mayor of the city, I can help all kids. But God had put these children right in front of me. And one of them reminded me just like my daddy, who was born poor to a single mom in the South, just like this boy named Hassan Washington. And he was so much like my father, he had the same wit and the same humor. Now my dad, mama couldn't take care of him, his grandmama raised him. This boy was being raised by his grandmother. You all know in our communities, many of our children are being raised by their grandparents. My dad's grandmother couldn't take care of him. He was taken in by a community. The black church saved him, gave him money to go to college. The community was there. I tried to be there for Hassan, but I got busy. I got elected president. I got elected, excuse me, I'm, I'm projecting. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Maybe that was a thunderbolt of prophecy. I don't know. Maybe that was a little prophecy. I got elected mayor of the city. I got elected mayor of the city. And in the first month, I was called to a scene of a shooting. One body covered, one body being put in the back of, a, of an ambulance, rushed to the hospital. And, and I, I attended to the people in the community. It was right in front of pastors, one, right in front of one court street. And, and, and I, I, I barely gave attention to the humanity killed on the street because I was too busy trying to minister to the living. Telling them that we would not let this happen in our city, that we were going to stand up talking to senior citizens about our plans. And then this is what happened. I go home that night trying to steal a few hours of sleep. I'm a newly elected mayor. And I'm looking through my Blackberry and I see the report from the homicide. The name was seared into my eyes because the name on my Blackberry was Hassan Washington. God had put him right in front of me. When I went to his funeral, pastor was at Perry's funeral home. And, and, and the pastor and I know Perry's well. It's right down the street from my church, Pastor Jefferson. Pastor Carter, you know this. There's all of them on one floor except for one basement room. And Hassan's body was laid out there, and I didn't like this room. He has narrow staircases going down. You feel like you're descending into the bowel of a ship. And there we were, chained together in grief, people moaning and growing, swaying on each other. And I was the newly elected mayor of the state's largest city, and I felt such shame in my heart. As we gather together for an American tradition, black men in America are 6% of all the people, but we make up over half of all the homicide victims. And I stood in the back, and I, I, I was hurting inside. I, I, I felt shame. Other people were looking to me for strength. I was the mayor of the city, but I had none to give. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth, because I couldn't stay. I, I, I ran out of that funeral home, got into my new SUV, drove down to City Hall, ran into my new palatial office, slammed the door shut, and for the first time as a mayor, I sat on my couch and I wept. Here we were, gathered together, in that funeral, all of us showing up, packed. We were all there for his death, but where were we for that boy's life? How can we have come so far as a people when we used to be lynched and beaten, terrorized, and now we have the leading cause of death of our children right now is homicide. But I tell you what I leaned on in that moment, what got me off, off of that couch, which brought me back to the understanding that weeping may endure through the night. It was the words of my tenant leader in the projects, a woman named Miss Virginia Jones. We named a street after her in that neighborhood. She had her son in the 80s murdered in the lobby of the buildings I moved into. And she never gave up. She never took her hands off the plow. She never moved out of the neighborhood in which her son was slain. Every day she got up. I once asked her why she stayed, and she looked at me indignantly, and she said, why do I stay here? because I'm in charge of Homeland Security. Yes. She didn't wait for a title. She didn't wait for a presidential appointment. She didn't need to be a cabinet member. She knew that change in our communities always comes from the grassroots up. And I want to leave you with what she said to me, a man broken from the death of another child. When I was giving in to the seduction of despair, when I was losing my way and felt darkness swallowing my soul, I got up early in the morning, came down in the elevators of Brick Towers, came out into the courtyard, and these were the words, because I see her across the courtyard. With her back turned towards me, I feel like I am 100 feet underwater. And, and this, this woman almost, as she hears me screaming, screaming, she was five feet and a smidgen tall, but she turns around and she sees this man before her across the courtyard, hurting. And she does the only thing I needed at that moment, was she opened her arms. Now, I'm a six foot three former tight end from Stanford University, but I ran into her arms like a little boy. 
And this small woman hugged me and held me and rubbed my back. And she gave me words that I leaned on all throughout my time as mayor. I leaned on during my toughest days and I leaned on them in my good days too. The words I repeat to myself in the United States Senate when I feel like I am banging my head against an implacable wall of resistance. The words I'm saying to myself now as a presidential candidate because this is a long slog and there are discouraging days. And what does she say to me? The two words that she rubbed my back holding me as I began to cry in her shoulder over the death of another boy. She said these two things to me over and over again. She said, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful. I say this to this community right now. We are facing tough days where they're rolling back civil rights, tough days where they're rolling back voting rights, tough days where the black-white wealth gap has grown over my lifetime. These are tough days. But we as a people who have come this far by faith, we must stay faithful. We must stay faithful because if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we know we can move mounds. We must stay faithful because we know it's faith that has brought us up the rough side of the mountain. We must stay faithful because it has been the faith of our weary years, the faith of our ancestors' tears that has brought us thus far on the way. And I know that there may be tough days before us, but American history and black history in particular is a perpetual testimony to the achievement of the impossible. And now is the time that we put our faith in the Lord because he has showed us that impossible things can be made possible. He has taught us that I can do all things, all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And with faith we will go ahead. With faith we will make this a just nation. With faith justice will roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Beloved, let's thank Senator Booker. Let me give you a couple of instructions. Uh, next door where we had the other candidates is Reverend, where Reverend Jackson will speak to open us up for the black church panel for 2020 and how we can protect the vote and mobilize our community. And then after that across the hall will be uh, U.S. Representative Lucy Maybath. So if you start moving now and moving quickly, we'll meet you next door for the black church panel and across the hall for Congresswoman U Lucy McBath. Let's move and move quickly. <laughs>